today we're going to complete our study in 2 Thessalonians and uh, let's just pray shall we Lord God we thank you for your word your precious holy word we pray O oh God that the transforming quickening power of the word of God would work in our hearts and lives today uh, in Jesus name Amen Amen. <clears throat> well, before we get to one Thessalo uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, where we're hoping to finish the, the passage off, um, I want to do some background, actually, and teach about the value of work and the doctrine of work, because this is necessary background, if you like, to the passage we're looking at. One of the good things about going verse by verse through the Bible is that you, you, you're forced to cover certain subjects that probably, you know, you you wouldn't if you just random if you just chose topics to speak at, which one does with topical sermons. Um, there's certain subjects you tend to focus on more, which are kind of more exciting, perhaps, and other subjects would get neglected because uh, either because you don't feel like it's it's your area, or um, you know, or because it's just doesn't doesn't tickle your fancy and so that way important subjects can be uh, avoided and, uh, and but if you go verse by verse through the bible then you're forced to to tackle these subjects as well but and they are important and one of those subjects is work uh, and so we first of all to spend a bit of time talking about the the, the importance of work and the doctrine of work and um, the thing is I think oft, often we have a wrong attitude to work in 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 our culture and uh, even as Christians we might think of it as as uh, unimportant or unspiritual but it is very important I mean you spend a huge chunk of your life working well Many, many, many of you do. Hopefully, you do. Um, when I talk about work, by the way, I'm not just talking about, you know, um, working for a salary. Um, that is, is of course, work. But also, students work at school, at university. What they're doing is is work. They're 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 in training. Um, also, um, a, a woman, a housewife, a mother bringing up children at home, that is work too. So we're all, we should all be involved in some form of work. Um, and, and we spend a lot of time working. So it is important. And I want to emphasize the value of work and the importance of work. And that we never get too spiritual for work. All right. As if work is some kind of necessary evil uh, that we kind of you know that we think that our real life is in in leisure and uh, you know a big part of our culture is kind of like people uh, and w which we've inherited from the Greek culture and I want to show you that the the biblical Hebrew culture is quite different but the the kind of Greek culture uh, and the Thessalonians were Greek so this is one thing Paul was trying to teach them was a work ethic and the Greeks had this idea that really, you've really made it when, you've, when you're wealthy enough that you can have slaves and servants to do all the work for you, and then you can live a life of leisure. And in their idea, that's the ideal. That's, that's real living. living. And so they were really into entertainment, into sports, into all these things. That was what they really valued. Work was a kind of necessary evil. And if you could have slaves to do that for you, then so much the better. But that is totally not the biblical attitude. Um, God actually created us for work. And work is good for us. And work is valuable. And it's not a necessary evil. So we need to, first of all, understand, you know, according to the Bible, work is a blessing. It's a gift from God. You should realize your job is a gift from God. It's not a necessary evil that you've got to knock together enough money to, to get by. In fact, if you are rich and you are got plenty of money, you should still work. You should still be productive in your life and use that money for good purposes to bless mankind and and to to serve the kingdom of God. Um, work was introduced 
right at the start of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to go there first, it's actually the second divine institution. The first divine institution was free will, that's in Genesis 1. The second one, even before marriage and family, was, it was work. And uh, in fact, the first four divine institutions are creative institutions. They, they are productive, creative ones. The, the next two, after, that came in after the fall of man, which is the human government and the nation state, they are really just brought in to restrain evil. They came in because of sin as a break, as a restraint on evil. But uh, work is designed by God before the fall. In other words, it isn't something that came in just to uh, kind of uh, to kind of uh, restrain our sinfulness. Now that now you know to keep to keep us occupied, so we don't sin too much. Although it does have that purpose too. It's actually God's idea for mankind even before man fell into sin. So it is designed for man to work that's part of how god made us we are meant to be workers and he created us to be active and productive not to be idle and it is also true as as i said that as they say an idle mind and an idle hand is the devil's workshop and uh if you're passive in your life you're not working you're not being productive then you are open to all kinds of negative stuff getting in and um, and so work does restrain sin in our life. It does restrain selfishness because it gets our eyes off ourself uh, and causes us to do things that will bless others. See, you're in your job, whatever you're doing, you are blessing other people. Otherwise, you wouldn't. There wouldn't be any kind of financial reward in it. Nobody would give you the money for it if it wasn't being a blessing. So, if the trouble with not working is that we have the opportunity for just to get self-centered and and focus on ourselves and so having some kind of work even if it's not a salary job it's 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 a volunteer work or or helping others but we need to be productive for our own self-worth a uh, feeling of self-worth that we've we're achieving something we're contributing something it's important to the way god has actually made us and and the devil does take advantage he works through laziness and passivity and so genesis 2:15 notice god has just created adam and then immediately in genesis 2:15 then the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eden to tend and keep it and that's the very first job he was given the job of god of being the gardener to tend it and to keep it means to guard it so he was given something to look after, to cultivate, to get the maximum production out of it, and to guard it, including guarding it against the devil. And then it says, The Lord God freely commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the, of the garden you may freely eat. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. I just want to mention this, that in his work there was a produce there was fruit that was pr produced and maximized that he would have gathered the fruit and so on um but he was told not to eat of a certain certain tree and th this was important because by not eating of that tree he was acknowledging it belongs to the lord uh, and that way he stayed under god's authority and that is like the tithe today giving god the first fruits to god to honor him to honor the fact that he is in authority that he's given me this job and so i don't take it all to myself but as it says in leviticus the tithe belongs to the lord and so adam sinned as it were by by taking what was not his by taking from that uh and by disregarding God's authority and ownership of the garden. So in our work, we, we then need to give glory to God by actually giving him the first fruits from what he has given us. And so it's interesting, then in verse 18, only then, only after he's got a job, that the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone, I will make him a helper comparable to him. So I want you to notice that work comes before marriage. All right. Um, that's why it really doesn't make sense for children at school 
to be dating. I mean, come on, what's that about? Because then you can't, you're not anywhere close to being ready to getting married. So where, where is that going to go? Um, so work comes before marriage. So in other words, a woman should not even think about marrying a man who's not able and willing to work. He needs to have a work ethic. He needs to be at least beginning about beginning to establish himself in a certain form of work. Also, a man should not think about marriage until he's established in his work. You know, because God only brought Eve to Adam after setting him up with a job. Okay, uh, Proverbs twenty four twenty seven says, "Prepare your outside work, make it fit for yourself in the field." In other words, get yourself up to. You know, it doesn't mean you've got to be totally uh, the top of your field before you can marry, but. You need at least to to reach a point of basic competence in your workplace that you're employable. Um, make it fit for yourself, and then it says afterward build your house, and that means have your have your wife and your family. And so, this places an importance on work that it came comes first, even before marriage and family in the order of things. Then in Genesis three, the next chapter, we see the curse come in because of man falling into sin and that had an effect on work uh, in fact this is one reason why people have a negative attitude to, to work because whatever job you have however uh, nice it is there's always an element of sweat of that it's hard it's difficult there's it, it oh you know it's it, it it's it's challenging and you know some aspects of work uh, are you really enjoy you're using your gift and everything is great but there'll be other aspects always that, that you really don't want to do that part of the job and yet you have to do it genesis three seventeen talks about this because before the fall it was easy to go, do the gardening in the garden of eden because there weren't any weeds but notice god says to adam this is going to be the result of your sin now he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. Remember, his, his work was in tilling the ground of the Garden of Eden, but now the ground comes under a curse. Uh, in, in, and we do our work in the world, and there's a curse in the world, which means we have to put forth an effort to overcome that chaos, that disorder, all the time. Um, not just in human behavior, but in, in the very environment is under this curse the, called the curse of the fall. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. In other words, now, Adam, you're going to have to really put some effort in all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you. So in other words, it, 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 it's, you know, there's going to be resistance to you now, Adam. Before nature just obeyed you, everything was easy. But now thorns and thistles, you're going to have to do some weeding. All right, you're going to, you're going to have to, it's not just about producing these lovely flowers. You are going to have to keep guarding it and watching over the negative things coming in. And you will eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, in the sweat of your face, it's going to be hard work. You will eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And I want you to notice that that curse is still in action. Because, for instance, we're all going to die, we're all going to die if the rapture doesn't happen. And that's the curse of Adam. So, it's true, however, that by walking in the blessing of God... If we surrender our job to God and ask for his blessing on us, we can, that will mitigate and push back the effects of that curse. But we, you cannot, we cannot overcome the, the total effect of the curse of the fall because it's still operational in the earth. For instance, you can walk in divine, because of the blessing, you can walk in divine health all your life, but you're still going to die if Jesus doesn't return because that curse of the fall is still in action. Uh, and so that means that your work will have elements to it that, that will mean you, you're going to have to put forth effort you're going to have to sweat a bit and that, that doesn't mean there's something wrong in, in with you it's just part of the new situation and I think that's one reason why people 
um, they may have negative attitudes to their jobs because they focus on the hard parts of their job that they don't enjoy doing. But just realize you're, you're not the only one. It, whatever job it is uh, has that. You might think, oh, I'd love to be an athlete, you know, running around the stadium or a football player, you know, enjoying, you know, all the success and the glamour and so on. But you do you know, um, I've talked talk to uh, the odd professional footballer, not no famous ones, but, you know, they have to almost sell their soul to actually um, perform at that level. They don't have any very little free time of their own. They're they're totally um, controlled by the requirements of, of the, the training and the club and so forth. And they have to pay a big price of of very tedious training often to to have those moments in the spotlight. So every job is like that. Let's go now to Exodus 28. And this is interesting because work is in the Ten Commandments. In fact, the fourth commandment confirms the importance of work. You know, when we read this, this commandment, you almost certainly in your mind, it's all about the day of rest, the Sabbath day. And, uh, I want you to notice, though, that the main emphasis of this commandment, and you're not going to like this, the main emphasis of this commandment is that you should work for six days. So we're rather blessed to, uh, this is Exodus 28, we're rather blessed actually to have a two-day weekend, many, many people do anyway, but that's not particularly biblical. The, the command is to work for six days and to rest one day. Now, that was a blessing for the Israelites because when they were slaves in Egypt, they actually worked for seven days. They didn't have a day of rest. So let's have a look at it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 9, six days you shall labor and do all your work. <laughs> we miss that. That's a command. So in other words, work is, is integral to your life. You are meant to work. You are designed to work. You're meant to find fulfillment in your work. And, and again, it's not just employment. It might be looking up, bringing up your children. It might be doing volunteer work. You know, everyone's in different situations. But um, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. And then the reason is given in verse 11. For in six days God made the heaven and the earth, the earth sea and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. So notice what it's saying is God is a worker, and God worked for six days, and then he rested the seventh day. And so in the same way, we are made in the image of God, just as God works and is, was, is creative and productive through his work, so we are to work. And that's a big part of our life, and that is honorable and good and satisfying uh, on a deep level. Um, and then God rested the seventh day. And really, resting the seventh day, a big part of that rest is, is so that we might work better on those other six days. So work, notice, is not presented as a necessary evil uh, part because of sin, but actually we're imitating God. We're being like God when we work. In other words, we are meant to work just like God. Jesus said the same thing in John 5.17. John 5.17, Jesus answered them, My father has been working till now, and I have been working. He says, Gee, I'm walking in the footsteps of my father. My father's been working, so I am working. And, uh, and so not to work not to be employed in some productive activity is unhealthy. It's not good for you. And, and like I say, uh, if sometimes people are not able to work, we understand that, it, either because of a disability or perhaps uh, the work situation sometimes in history is so bad that even there isn't any kind of work, not even the menial kind of work or, or the, you know, the, the, the mo you know, not even the simplest jobs. And, and so that this person, it's, it's not, it's not their fault, but clearly the Bible says, if you are able to work, you should work. Um, and, to be idle, you see, is not good for you. 
you become passive and that becomes the devil's playground because when your life is empty when you're passive then to fill up that emptiness you will call upon unhealthy things like drugs and that to, to try and make yourself feel better you will fall into sin and that's why idleness is the devil's playground um, one thing that we've inherited from greek culture is the exaltation of leisure above all now, there's nothing wrong with leisure but the problem was that um, now often people live for entertainment they count the hours during the day until it's evening when they can have some kind of entertainment or they count the days until the weekend when they think they can really live and so they're not getting any satisfaction from their work because they devalue it to them it's a it's a necessary evil they do not see it as a divine gift and call but um, it's just what they have to do to bring in some money and that's a sad thing especially for Christians we should realize this is our ministry our work is our ministry our, our work is our worship to God and it's the way the number one way in which we are a blessing to society we are blessing to others through our work in Hebrew thinking, God made man to work and to worship. Those are the main things. And that, yes, to rest, that's part of the pattern of life. But the pursuit of leisure and entertainment was not like the, the big thing. All right, a bit of that is good. But in the Greek culture that we've inherited from, it's like the main thing is to be entertained and, and the rest of your life is, is really just to get enough money together so you can get entertained. That is absolutely anti-biblical. Jesus exalted work by being a carpenter or a, maybe a builder, a technon, till he was 30. So just think about this. In the, in the Jewish culture, from age 12, the... Um, a, a boy would be considered a man after age 12. That's the bar mitzvah kind of time. I think it's 13 now. But um, And then Jesus would, was, would have started working with his dad in the, as a carpenter, as a builder, helping his dad, being apprenticed. And he did that for 18 years till he was, uh, went into the ministry. So 18, for 18 years he did manual labor skilled labor but manual labor and his ministry was only three and a half years now that that doesn't seem to make sense to us does it uh, in fact in those days a jewish rabbi couldn't couldn't become a rabbi until he had learned to trade for himself uh, and so jesus was exalting the value of work and notice that all his disciples were successful businessmen and um and so we can devalue work on one hand because we are infected by the worldly attitude to work, that work is this evil thing. Um, I even experienced that going up to university. Like, uh, even though it was Oxford University, you would have thought it might be different. But even then, there was this kind of culture, part, partly, that uh you know what what are you doing working you're working hard you know don't come on you know uh you're a nerd kind of thing and and there's this culture that work is somehow you know the real the real life is getting drunk the real life is getting entertained in different ways and the work you know if you're going to go to university that yes by all means join a club and do other th other things but the number one thing has to be your work and so uh, that's one side of it, the kind of worldly attitude. The other side that can happen that, that really relates to the Thessalonians, partly, is that we can be, uh, when we're awakened spiritually, we, or we can sometimes become overexcited spiritually, especially when we enter into, into new spiritual realms, as it were, that we can fall into another Greek trap, which is the Greeks had this idea that the, the spirit was valuable and the flesh was, yeah, totally of no value at all. So anything natural doesn't matter, anything spiritual, and they made this sharp division. They devalued natural things like work. 
and um, and so Christians can do that because you can and I'll share my testimony about this as well and so we can think of work as a negative thing because it just gets in the way of my prayer life it gets in the way of me speaking studying the bible it gets in the way of all the spiritual things i want to do and so i start seeing this work as a negative thing and that is wrong actually because your work is is your ministry to god um, it is right of course that we value the things of god above everything and that natural things should not be idols to us so no natural thing should be more important to us than our relationship with god but in hebrew thinking God created the natural world as well as the spiritual world, and the two should be in harmony. So our work is of God, and it's important to God that we do our job well. And the, our work is not our enemy. Uh, now, of course, if we put our work above our worship of God, and I believe that includes church life, then, you know, worshipping God in church that work becomes an idol but that isn't to say we should devalue our work we need to integrate our work into our life and and embrace our job our work as a god-given activity and an opportunity to be a blessing i had this testimony and i suppose i had to go through this sometimes i think we have to go through this i mean i went to university and for me i was very much focused on my work i found purpose in in you know my my idea that i would become a maths professor you know and uh it was a strange thing maths was not my favorite subject at school until i hit the sixth form and suddenly i found i could do maths better than anyone else in the school and uh, i found myself uh you know um uh, going to oxford and um and so this i was fulfilling my dream here and then i when i came to oxford I, in my first term i i received the lord I, suddenly the whole spiritual world opened up to me and um as i was uh and and i did get discouraged a little bit because the maths was a lot harder at oxford than it was at school and i wasn't any more the best like in school i was the best so i thought i thought wow this is this is great in oxford i suddenly found out i wasn't the best there were lots of other clever people around and that got me a bit discouraged and sadly my tutors didn't encourage me because i found out later that they thought i was i had great promise you know as a, as a mathematician and had they told me that that would have uh, actually uh, encouraged me a lot but anyway like um but as i, I became awakened to spiritual things uh, and i realized how important these spiritual things were and the word of god was uh, in my second term i began to to slack off my work uh, against the advice of my christian friends in order to get in and in fact i took a whole week off my studies which at oxford is disastrous because the rate of the new material coming through is too so fast that i then fell totally behind and um second year was even worse i i i did i didn't do didn't work well at all but i was pursuing god i was pursuing spiritual things so it wasn't all bad um and um but the problem was i was out of balance yes before my work was an idol yeah, and, and now god came into my life and now i had to integrate my work within my relationship with god and but i got it wrong but but to start with and i don't know if i i had to go through this phase i'm not sure i i so focused on the spiritual that i neglected my work and and i lost interest in the work and um and and so that that was becoming a failure in my life and i wasn't enjoying the work and as i unfortunately i got away with it because in those days which was a foolish thing but in those days they in in oxford mathematics they decided in their wisdom that there would be no exams second year no tests and none of the courses in the second year counted towards the final mark because they wanted us to be free to pursue our interests well that didn't work for me i that total lack of structure allowed me too much freedom um but i thought 
I can't. I'm not used to failing, and I refuse to fail. And as I come into the third year, fortunately, this desire to get on top of my work came back. And I felt the Lord say to me that he wanted me to be interested in my mathematics, and he wanted me to do well in it as a witness to others as well. And 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 our work is, is a big part of our witness. And, um, and so... I came back into line. It wasn't an idol anymore, but now I, I integrated it in my life and I gave it value and I was able to finish off the degree in a, in a decent way. Not as well as it could have been had I been consistent all the way through, but good enough to squeak, uh, to squeak a first. But uh, anyway, um, so that's my testimony. So there is a danger that when we come into spiritual things, spiritual experiences, that we then devalue the natural things in our life, um, like work. And, and that's a danger to watch out for. And that was an issue for some of the Thessalonian Christians, as we'll see. So let me just, again, just summarize to say work is good. It causes you to focus on doing things to benefit others. It's good for your character, uh, whereas unemployment and passivity is dangerous for your mind and body, for your character, because the danger is you'll become more self-absorbed. And so, and, and, and you know, even the negative, what you think is the negative aspects of work, you know, like those, those times when you really don't want to go into work. You'd rather be doing other things that were easier. Uh, and you have to overcome your flesh just to show up. It's actually good for you because that is building your character. That is building your endurance. So if somebody is soft and a slave of their desires, they just always just do whatever they want to do. That person is weak. Um, so, you know, if you are unemployed, it's best to get a job, even if you have to humble yourself. And, and get not not the perfect job um, because you are serving others and uh, in the biblical thinking by the way a manual job is just as good as working with your brain obviously it's best to find a job that fits your gift and your passions but you might not get that immediately all right sometimes you've got to work your way to that ideal job that you're looking for and you have to do other jobs that that you don't enjoy so much but do it unto the lord and you will find satisfaction in that and you will learn important lessons in life uh, you know obviously sometimes people cannot get a job for various reasons but there should always be ways in which we can be productive and bless others maybe being an intercessor can be your work and and give give hours of your day to prayer if you don't have praying for others if you don't have the opportunity to work in other ways maybe you could do volunteer work for a charity but uh, whatever you do do not get caught into a passivity let me give um a couple of scriptures to just to back this up but the the new testament uh has a strong work ethic Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. In other words, God created you to work, praise God, and to do it well. Ephesians 4.28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to those who have need in other words one reason you should work is that you have a certain amount of money that you can give into the kingdom of god into helping other people's needs that should be a motivation for you to work colossians 3:23 is really important it's saying that your work is your ministry you know we all have a ministry and and our big the main part of our ministry is our work and whatever you do, it says, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So do it, whatever you job you've got, do it with all your heart. Be the best at it. And now we go into the background to, one Thessalo to 2 Thessalonians. So this is 1 Thessalonians 4.11. 
says, aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, <laughs> to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And we're going to say that Paul actually uh, is telling the Thessalonians that because some of the Thessalonians are not working and they're sponging off the other members of the church because they didn't have a welfare state in those days. And uh, these ones who were idle um, actually started getting involved in everyone else's business. They become busybodies. They become meddlers and troublemakers because they didn't have any of their own business. And that's why he says, lead a quiet life, mind your own business, focus on your own work, all right, and work with your own hands as we commanded you. And we're going to see that in 2 Thessalonians that they actually, uh, this group of people had actually ignored what Paul said and the problem had got worse. And now in 2 Thessalonians, we're going to see Paul gets a lot stronger with these people because this is a serious issue. It's actually to not work is to disobey God's command, uh, the, as we've already seen. And he says that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. So he says, first of all, by working and by being good at your job, you are being a good witness to those on the outside. And secondly, it says that you may lack nothing. In other words, that you are providing for your own needs and you don't have to depend on others. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5.14... He says, um, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Now, this word unruly, I just want you to, to catch this because this is going to come up again three times in the passage we're going to deal with today. Warn those who are unruly. So he's already having to warn the, these ones. This word unruly means undisciplined. It could be used of a soldier who is marching out of rank or who has abandoned his post who is playing truant, marching out of rank. So it's actually talking about people, for whatever reasons, they've given up their jobs and they're not working now. They, it's not that they, they, they can't work, but they, they've, they, they, they refuse to work. Um, possibly because of the Greek culture they come out of, but uh, also because they, I think they may have become spiritually excited. And one theory that people have is because the Thessalonian letters are so full of the, the coming of the Lord, the rapture, and the fact that the Lord could come at any time, they got so excited expecting the rapture at any time that they just said, well, if the Lord's coming soon, you know, what's the point of going out to do my ordinary work? You know, and so they got overexcited and gave up their jobs. And the trouble is they had too much time on their hands. And now they're going around in the church, causing problems, gossiping, meddling in other people's business, telling everyone else what they ought to do and, and making a nuisance of themselves. And these are the ones that Paul calls unruly. And there's a, clearly a, gr a growing group of them in the church. And, and it says, um, warn those who are unruly. All right, so finally now we come to our passage um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we've, we're now in verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 4, and it says, And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things that we command you. Now in this passage, Paul is speaking with great authority much more than in his usual kind of encouragement uh, kind of phrase he is using the word i think five times this word command this is the word that would be used of in a, of by an officer in the army making commands to his soldiers so he is now paul is is He's feeling he's going to he's going to have to sort this problem out in the church, and he's making commands, and he is saying, "I've I have got confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you do, and you that you're doing, and you will do the things we command you." And he's gonna the next section is is a section where he's giving some very clear commands, and um, notice he's 
he's under the Lord's authority. He's speaking as the Lord's spokesman. He says, I've got confidence in the Lord. Because I am giving the commands from the Lord, I have confidence that as I give these commands to you, the Lord's grace is backing me up and is convicting you and will give you the grace to obey these commands. That's why he says, I have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you do and you will do the things we command you. And so the tone is now changed. Paul is now becoming the commander, as it were, and he is saying, I want you to do and continue doing the things I command you. And now, verse 5, he, he speaks about the fact that, that we can do these things by the grace of God. He says, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. Now, this is um, a prayer to Christ, actually. Um, there aren't many uh, prayers directly to Christ, but this is a prayer to the Lord Jesus to direct their hearts. Now, this word direct is word for the word for creating a road by removing obstacles. You would remove obstacles and thereby you create a road. And what he's saying is, I want, I, I, I ask the Lord to focus your hearts, that your hearts have a clear focus into the love of God, first of all. And here he's talking about, he's talking about doing the right works. Um, but what's important is the, our attitude behind our work. When, when we do our work, I do, we should be doing it from the right heart of love to God, first of all, and love for people, um, that we're doing it as a blessing. It's not a burden, it's a blessing. And um, let me just give you a quick grammar point here. When it says the love of God, uh, or the faith of God, or th words like that, that's a, called a genitive, of God. That's the genitive case. And it can either be object. Um, a, a subjective genitive or an objective gen genitive, all right? So this could mean two things, or maybe both. The love of God, if God is the one loving, he's the subject of the sentence, he's the one doing the loving, that's called a subjective genitive. If it means, on the other hand, the love of the love of God can also mean our love for God. Then, that's the objective genitive. All right? This will go over some of your heads, I realize, but I thought it would be helpful for some of you. In other words, God is the object of the love. It can mean that too. So it either means the love of God, either means the, the love that God has for us, or it's the love that we have for God. All right? It could be either or both. And so I believe what he's saying here is probably both. He's saying, in, in your work, the focus of your hearts, so, and if the, it should be on God's love for you, how much God loves you. That God's given you this work to do, to glorify him. And because he loves you, you want to love him. And you love him through that work. And... Um, in other words, that should be our motivation. And when we have that attitude, then the road will be, the obstacles will be removed and we will do our work beautifully, you see. And then he also says, and into the patience of Christ. And again, this could be objective or subjective. It can mean the patience that Christ has, that Christ, and this is talking about the continuation of doing a work. Don't just do a job for a week and then quit. He, God wants us to have that perseverance, that patience, that continuation to see a job through to its conclusion. And he's giving the patience of Christ as, an, as the example because Christ saw the terrible work he had to do dying for us on the cross. He saw it through. That's the perseverance of Christ until its glorious conclusion. And so he says, you, you also need to have this focus of perseverance of seeing that job through to its conclusion. That, that's what I believe what he's saying. He says, so in your job, be focused on the love of God and loving God and also 
having that same patience that Christ has of starting a job and seeing it through until you've done it properly. That's the attitude that you should have in your work. But now we get into Paul correcting the what the ones he calls the disorderly brethren or the idle brethren. But we command you, verse 6, we command you brethren. There's that word co- command again, para and angelo. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he is speaking in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's like a general speaking in the name of the king. All right, it's not just Paul telling us this. It's Jesus himself giving this command through Paul in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you withdraw from every brother that walks disorderly and not according to to the tradition which he received from us. So the tradition is the apostolic teaching. When Paul was with the Thessalonians, as we're going to see, he taught them about this, the importance of work. And And that was in 1 Thessalonians 2. That's the apostolic tradition, the apostolic teaching. And here he's saying there are brothers... They are brothers, they're they're believers, but they're walking disorderly. And this is this word that means um, they're idle. They're not working. They're not contributing in any way. And uh, as we're going to see, they're actually causing trouble because they got too much time on their hands. And um, he... It's interesting what he says, and it says is a tricky one now, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. And uh, this word is the word for, for, for you know, if you've got sails, for, 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 what's it called? Oh, anyway, wrapping up the sails, um, uh, for example. And it's talking about withdrawal. Now, this is a... <laughs> We can relate to this now because we, we, we talk about social distancing, don't we? Um, we Social distancing, as somebody put it, now everyone we meet, it's rather sad, is a biohazard. <laughs> so because they might have the virus, we keep a meter or two meters away from them. Uh, beca- we keep a distance from them. And what does it mean by withdrawing? It sounds kind of nasty, doesn't it? Withdraw from this brother. How can we explain this? Um, One reason, and and, and I would simply say this, that when somebody is behaving badly, they're being disorderly, and, and this might be within your family, all right? This might be one of your children, or it might be, you know, some somebody who's a friend, but they are involved in bad behavior, you do not want to endorse that behavior. You don't want to be too closely associated with it. So even though you love them, you do not withdraw your love, but you distance yourself from them. Now, that's an instinctive thing, all right? If you approve of their bad behavior, then you'll get right in there with them, all right? But the problem is, if you act towards them exactly the same way as if they were being delightful then um, you're endorsing their bad behavior. You can't do that. So you instinctively withdraw from them. It doesn't mean you don't talk to them, but you can't be as close to them as you would otherwise. You can't approve of what they're doing. So Paul, I think, is really saying here that it's, it's valid to withdraw. You might think, well, that's not the loving thing to do. But actually it is, because if, they, if you just treat them the same way, they, you're encouraging them in their sin. I'm not just talking about doing that if they do something you don't agree with, but if they are, in a, if they are acting sinfully, if they are a bad influence on others, if they are creating a bad atmosphere, then you instinctively withdraw. And Paul says, actually, that instinct is correct. You still love them. You still pray for them. You're still polite to them, but you can't be as close to them. Because uh, apart from any other reason, why do we social distance from each other? To avoid contamination. If you get too close to somebody who's in a bad spirit, a bad attitude, that will start rubbing off on you. So that instinct is correct to withdraw 
And Paul says, you need to do that from these people. Do not encourage them in their sin. Don't spoil them. What the worst thing a parent can do with a child who's acting badly is, is just brush it off as, oh, it doesn't really matter. They're cute, aren't they? Especially with young, young ones. You're spoiling them. Okay, they need to know that their behavior is not acceptable and, and there's a withdrawal. You, you, you still love them just as much, but they need to know that you are not accepting that behavior. And so that's what he means, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. They're still let your brother. Don't get me wrong. But um, and it says not according to the tradition he received from us. Verse seven. Paul is going to take quite a few verses on this because this is obviously becoming a big problem in the church. There's a whole group of them and and they are spreading this because they're telling everyone else, hey guys, you need to give up your job. Don't waste your time on that mundane job. You you could be in this spiritual excitement with us because the Lord's coming soon and the result of it is serious for the church because, you know, the New Testament church especially was a minority in that city and usually a very unpopular minority too. And the their enemies, they had plenty of enemies and they were, would be looking for any opportunity to attack and discredit the church. And if you've got a bunch of the church members acting badly and disorderly lives, that reflected badly on the church and, and uh, brought attack on the church. Um, discredited the church so this was becoming a serious issue Um, verse 7 for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us and this is the word to imitate he says you know imitate us because we gave you a model to follow imitate us for we were not disorderly among you he said when we came to preach the gospel to you we did not we were not disorderly all right we were not like that we gave you a model verse 8 nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. In other words, Paul is saying, oh, we, we did not come into town expecting you to look after us, okay, um, and, um, and having an easy life. Uh, in fact, he says, we worked with labor and toil. Do you see that emphasis? We worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. He explained in 1 Thessalonians that he said the same thing because he didn't want them, he didn't want to be accused of taking advantage of them, like some of the Greek orators who would, um, you know, as it were, get money out of people and, 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 and live an easy life. He actually said, I didn't want you to think I'm just doing this to get money out of you. So he, Paul deliberately supported himself even while he was preaching the gospel to them and he worked hard at his tent making trade with labor and toil and he was doing it to give them an example verse 9 not because we do not have authority in other words he says we could and he develops this in 1 corinthians as well and timothy he says we would have had the right to for you to support us financially because we were working in the work of the ministry we, we could have had the authority, but we chose not to use it. But, he says, to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us or imitate us. In other words, Paul was giving a model to the Thessalonians. Perhaps he knew it was a Greek problem that, that, you know, that their ideal was not to work and just to be at leisure and and just do whatever you want and Paul was coming in and saying no I want to model to you the godly way of living and so to provide a model of hard work of having a work ethic and so just in case Paul didn't want them to get the idea that oh if once you become spiritual like the apostle Paul and Paul had spiritual experiences way beyond probably anyone else in church history yet Paul was saying all my spiritual experiences doesn't lift me beyond the realm of work I still work hard and so if Paul was willing to work hard that puts a great value as we saw Jesus too he worked all his life and that that means work is of value work is of God And to have a work ethic is a godly thing. And um, 
we don't make an idol of the work, but we should be imitators of God. And as I say, God worked six days and then he rested one day. So he says, we provided a model uh, so that you understand that Christians work. Just because you may have spiritual experiences does not mean you do not work. Paul says, look at me. Look at the experiences I have. He's an apostle. He's seen the Lord. He's, he went to heaven. But nevertheless, he worked hard. And I love that way that the spiritual and the natural were both important to, to Paul. And so he is saying, I gave you an example. And then verse 10. He says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this. So this is good teaching, by the way. And parents need to teach their children on two levels, by precept and by example. All right. So verse 10, it says he commanded them. He gave them the instruction. But he in verse 9, he modeled it. So parent, when parents teach their children, they also need to model it for the children. So the children will see. This is, you know, can see it modeled as well. They see it and they hear it. And then that's proper teaching. And so he says, even when we're with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. And um, this is a saying. And it's interesting that in the, it's in the imperfect tense when it says he, we commanded you, which means he it, he didn't just say it once. He said it constantly. We commanded you. It, he re repeated it. If, if anyone will not work, it doesn't say if anyone is unable to work, but if anyone will not work. In other words, they're capable of working, but they refuse to work. They're idle. Neither shall he eat. And what this is saying is not that somebody who doesn't work will not eat. But uh, he's saying he's actually giving a command here. What this means is this. There were these idle people in the church. And of course, in those days, there, there was no welfare state. And um, as a result, these ones were, were sponging off everyone else in the church. So they wouldn't have anything to do. So they would tend to go around the, the members of the church and, and, the, and sponge off them. And, and ask them for money, ask them for a meal, and so on. And they'd have all this extra time, as we're going to see. They would start getting into gossip and meddling in other people's business. But Paul is saying here, actually, if, this, if it's such a person that they are refusing to work, when they come to your house, do not give them any food. All right? Do not give them any money. Because then you're just encouraging them in their sin. OK, now, if somebody is wanting to start a business and you want to help them get going, that's that's great because they want to work. But if somebody just refuses to work and wants to sponge off you, you should not do it. And really, the welfare state should be for people who cannot work, who need to be supported. But it should not provide any help for people who can work, uh, but refuse to work. And so. If anyone will not work, this is this is the Bible, all right? Then he, don't don't feed them, don't provide for them, because you're just encouraging them in the flesh. Verse eleven: For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. There's that same word again: disorderly, idle. They refuse to work, not working at all. There it is. They're not doing, but they are busybodies. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, in the Greek, it's a play on words. We, we might say they are not busy, but they are busy bodies. In other words, they are, oh, yes, they're a hive of excitement and of activity, but they are not doing anything productive in their life. They, they are busy, um, but they are actually not doing anything real. They are busy bodies. It's interesting, in 1 Timothy 5.13, um, it describes these same people. 1 Timothy 5.13, um, 
it says it, it, it says that the problem with idleness is not just not doing work and sponging off others, but also it means that they are actually become a nuisance. Um, it says, besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but the problem is they become gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. And, and what happens is, because they've got, they've got no business of their own, they've got nothing that they're engaged in that is demanding their time and effort, they get involved in everyone else's lives. They become gossips and busybodies and they start pointing out to other people what they ought to be doing better. They become armchair critics and so on. And they actually create problems uh, because they they and, and and god would say to them mind your own business focus on your own business all right going back now we're almost there in 2 thessalonians chapter 3 he says they're not busy but they're busy bodies that's verse 11 now verse 12 2 thessalonians 3 verse 12 now those are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ, again notice the authority there, that they work in quietness. Quietness is a tranquil state of mind. You know, the best workers have a tranquil state of mind. They're not kind of all kind of making a big fuss all the time. They're just getting on with it. A tranquil state of mind. They work in quietness and they eat their own bread. In other words, they earn their own money. That's that's what God expects. Um there, there are cases, of course, where people are unable to work for whatever reason, and then they are deserving of support. Um, but these are talking about people who are quite capable of working, and they are now being corrected. And verse 13, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And, and one problem is the effect these ones have on others. People say, well, look, I'm here am I working hard? nine to five or whatever and here are these people lounging around going from house to house just chatting doing nothing and they seem to be all um spiritual maybe i should give up my job too you know and he, paul says do not grow weary in doing good in doing the right thing work is good bless be blessed by the fact you have a job verse 14 and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person. Now, Paul gets even stronger. He said, now, Paul's given the initial warning in 1 Thessalonians. Now there's a second stronger warning to say, you know, socially distance yourself from such a person if they still haven't repented. And now Paul gets even stronger. He says, if they still don't repent after I've given you this warning, you need to socially distance themselves yourself some more. Again, this is, I think, just a natural social distancing. Because the more somebody's hardened in their sin, and, uh, you know, you, you can't make rules about these things. Because, but, but in other words, Paul's saying, trust your instincts. Because if somebody goes deeper into that sin, then you have to distance yourself more in terms of not being their best pal you're still nice to them you still you know pray for them but you can't be their best pal because you you cannot approve of what they're doing and so he says note that person and do not keep company with them in other words don't mix your literally don't mix yourselves with them don't get mixed too closely mixed up in their lives because you're endorsing their bad behavior if you do that that he may be ashamed. In other words, that he he needs to be convicted. Notice verse 15, though. Paul is careful that people don't go overboard on this and say, oh, he's, he's out of order. I'm going to speak evil against him. No, that's absolutely not what Paul's saying. Verse 15, do not count him as an enemy. All right, do not count him as an enemy. Don't be nasty. All right, don't speak evil of him and so on, but admonish him as a brother. He's still your brother. It's a family issue. It's it's a family issue. You know, when a child behaves badly, maybe you've got to do some social distances. Go to your room until you you can be polite to us. All right, and when you're ready, you can come down again. You know, a bit of social distancing. Um, and so he says now, verse 16, as we wrap up 
Thessalonians, it finishes beautifully. And, and Paul is saying what we want, these people are actually have, were through their gossiping and their meddling, they've been disturbing the peace of the church. And notice now, Paul says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. Hallelujah. Peace here is from the Hebrew shalom, which means harmony. Harmony in your relationships, harmony in the church, harmony in your body, harmony in your mind, everything in your life fitting together in divine harmony. He, only God can do that for you. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. And what this means is always means this peace is meant to be a continual experience, the peace of God. And in every way means even in the hard situations, even when things go badly for you, there's the peace of God is always there for you. You can have the Lord's peace helping you through, even when your job is hard. The peace always in every way. And where does this peace come from? It's from the presence of the Lord. He says, the Lord be with you all. That's the key to peace. Walk with God and the Lord will be with you and he will give you that perfect peace. And then in verse 17, he says, The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. So actually what's happening here is Paul has been dictating the letter. But, but now, in fact, we saw in chapter 2, verse 2, we won't go there, but in chapter 2, verse 2, we see that some people have been writing, writing letters in Paul's name, but they were forgeries. And giving false teaching. So what Paul would do in all his letters is when it, as he comes to the end, he's been dictating, but then he gets the pen himself and he writes out the last two verses are written in Paul's own hand and with his distinctive handwriting. And so they will see that it's the distinctive letter writing of Paul. And this is a genuine letter of Paul. So this is why he says the salutation of Paul with my own hand which is a sign in every epistle. So he did this at the end of every epistle. He wrote a bit at the end in his own hand. So I write, he says. And then finally, he finishes with the, the usual grace blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that's exactly how we finished 1 Thessalonians, with the difference of one word, which is the word all. And that shows his pastoral heart. Notice he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Why does he emphasize all? Because he's been talking in this last chapter. Of you, he talks about the Thessalonian church generally. The majority were living in order, but there was a minority who were disorderly. All right. And he deals with them as them, as separate ones. But he says they're all brothers. And now, now the final thing is, he, he wants the unity of the church. The grace be with you all. In other words, he's wishing the grace of God upon them all, the orderly and the disorderly. They, they are all part of the church. In other words, he doesn't want them to think that they're being rejected or thrown out of the church or anything like that. He wants them to know they're all part of the family. They're all brothers. They're all under the grace of God. So this is him wanting to... Yes, he wants to bring them to repentance, but he is also still loving them. And he is still wishing the grace upon them all. And, and so it, the issue he's dealing with here is just like the issue of a father and a mother, let's say, with a child who is perhaps not, not doing their homework or not doing certain things right. How are they to deal with that? They, they can't just say, well... I love my children anyway, so I'm going to just be toward them just as if they were doing everything perfectly. They can't. That's not a possibility because, yes, they they love them, but they have to, they, they can't endorse bad behavior. So they have to indicate that. Um, but they need to do it in a way that the child still knows that they are loved. And so this saying, we love the sinner, but we hate the sin, is an extreme way of saying it. But when you make a correction, if you just focus on the negative behavior and you do not express love, then they will take that as a personal rejection. 
So that would be wrong. On the other hand, if all you do is express love, whatever they do, that would also be wrong because that would be condoning their behavior. So you have to, there has to be a duality. You, you have to communicate that you love them, you still love them, they're totally accepted, but at the same time, their behavior is not acceptable. And that's why there can be some social distancing required because um, you have to send that message. And so for them to have the full experience of their parents' love and the full blessing of being in the family, they, they have to adjust their heart attitude. And, and so that's the art of being a parent, I guess. Anyway, we're, I will bring that Bible study to an end. Hallelujah. And uh, God bless you. Have a great week. We will answer the odd question now. But um, I will, I will d dismiss you if, if you don't want to stay for the questions. God bless you. And uh, see you again soon. I have two questions here. So I'll go to the first here, which is from uh, Lynn. Um, and it says, Dear Pastor Derek, what does it mean if the Lord would say, I am leading you to a land flowing with milk and honey? What is the practical and spiritual application of a land flowing with milk and honey? Well, the land, of course, land flowing with milk and honey, that's the promised land. The milk and the honey, I mean, gosh, I forget what the significance of that, but... Um, I think it's it's obviously talking about abundance, that uh, in their time the, the milk would be the goat's milk primarily, um, and uh, and so it's talking about that there would there would be part of the land would would be good for for animals like goats. The honey, some people believe, is primarily date honey, uh, as well as the bee honey, and uh, that's talking about that also it be a land where there would be trees and fruit and uh, where bees, uh, you know, of agriculture. Uh, and so it's saying that this land has everything in a way. It's an abundant land. So if God is, is, does want us to, um, God wants to bring us, he wants to lead us with his presence into our promised land. And for yeah, our promised land is where all his promises are, are fulfilled in our life and and uh, and so generally it's talking about that the promises that we all have you know for health and blessing and joy and peace and all the spiritual blessings that god wants us to enjoy uh, and then also god has a specific promised land for each one of us and we have to trust god to lead us into the fulfillment of god's will and purpose for our life and, and ministry and we have to value but the key to getting into your promised land is to value his presence more than the promised land that was the test moses had god because god said to moses go into the you know you can go in the promised land if you want but i won't go with you and moses said no way your pr i'd rather stay in the wilderness and have your presence than have they promised land of my outward success without your presence and that was the test that Moses passed uh, the presence of God has to be the most important thing in our life our walk with God and then the presence of God actually led them step by step into their promised land and they had to be strong and of good courage to obey God and to follow his presence wherever he led them and he then could lead them into that promised land. So uh, what it means for each one of us, um, you know, varies. But basically the milk and honey is, is the blessings of the land, the fulfillment of the promises. All right, and one more question from Jocelyn. Uh, it's so important to have and respect good boundaries. God has good boundaries, like saying, you're welcome to come into my house, but only if you come through my son. We also need to set good boundaries that keep people out who are going to disrupt our spiritual progress. Social distancing, yes. That's another reason for social distancing. 
that you have to be careful who is very close to you, because if they're in a bad spirit, they can infect you. That's a, a, vir a negative virus transmission there. Um, that's why it says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. In other words, don't get in very close partnership with unbelievers because of that cross-contamination that can happen. And so it says that, um, so anyway, yes, I'm agreeing with you, I think. We also need to set good boundaries to, that keep people out who are going to disrupt our spiritual progress so that we stay strong enough to be able to help them form good boundaries. And also respecting other people's boundaries is just as important. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, and again, having boundaries doesn't mean we're, we're nasty to people or anything like that. But but we we need to um, uh, you know that's fair enough. And the final line is because Jesus was both divine and human, and He lives in us. Does that make us both human and divine? Uh, no, <laughs> we we are human. Uh, we Jesus is different from us in that respect. All right, Jesus is God and man, and the two natures of God and man are united in the person of Jesus and he is unique in that regard all right now um, the fact that he lives in us by his spirit does not change that fact all right the fact that God lives in us does not make us God all right um, that's very important to understand we are not God in that sense we are always going to be created beings however God the interesting thing is that when uh, this just I've been thinking about this recently so I'll just finish with this that the, uh, when Jesus was a man on earth he was man and he was God but as man, he was, as it were, disconnected from the glory of God. He laid aside the glory to be a man, as it were, with us, yet without sin. But in his resurrection, the resurrection did not change his deity. He was always God. But the resurrection changed his humanity. And in the resurrection, the glory of God, the divine glory of God somehow took possession of his humanity and transformed it and he was became a glorified man so now the glory of god is now fills his humanity and when we are resurrected we will be glorified doesn't mean we become god but what it does mean is that the glory of God will fill our humanity and we will be infused with God's glory and that will lift our humanity to something else. And in fact, this is what 1 John 3 says. 1 John 3, uh, if I can just vaguely remember it, uh, it's saying uh, that we are children, now we are children of God, but what we shall be, we we, is not yet manifested in other words we're going to be turned into something else we're going to be glorified we're children of god now our spirit is reborn but there's a glory coming that is not just going to make our bodies great but our whole humanity is going to be glorified god's glory is going to be released in it and we will become something else and it says for we shall be like him we shall be like him. And what does that mean? We shall be like him. Not that we're going to be God, but we, our humanity is going to be glorified just like Jesus' humanity was glorified. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And when we see him face to face in that day, we will receive of his glory into our humanity and we will be exalted into a level of being that will be higher than the angels. Uh, that we won't be God, but we will be glorified. All right? 
Uh, one more has come through. This is from Mark Crow. Evening, Pastor Derek. Thanks for your teaching on the on work this evening. Hosea 6.2 says, After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we will live in his sight. If the two days or the 2,000 years expires around the anniversary of the crucifixion in AD 33, would you be surprised if the rapture came after 2033? God bless, Mark. Now, okay, so this is where I can get into trouble because I've done this calculation. And again, I have to always prefix by saying these things are based on typology. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, so we cannot be categorical. So I do not know when the rapture is going to be. I don't know when the second coming is going to be. No one knows, okay? Um, We can only guess. We can only use typology. All right. So I need to say that. So if the rapture is after 2033, I might be a little bit surprised, but it wouldn't hurt my faith. It's quite possible that the rapture will be after 2033. But let me just explain how I understand this calculation. Um, And uh, you can put as much weight on it as you like. In fact, if you were going to predict a time this is the two days is not to the rapture it's to the second coming all right the two hosea's two thousand years to after two days he'll revive israel and then on the third day that's the millennium we will live in his sight that's israel will live in his sight so the end of the two days is um after two thousand years is that's the second coming so that so if that typology works out the second coming will be in 2033 however um i don't think it's from the cross in fact if you look at the hosea prophecy he talks about the cross and then he talks about him returning to heaven and it also talks about the judgment on israel now i can't go into this but i believe israel was cut off six months later all right, this is based on Luke 13, the parable of the fig tree. Jesus comes for three years, and then Israel are given one more year of grace. That takes you to six months after the cross when Israel will be cut off. And that happened at Stephen's speech. That's the prosecuting speech. That's when Jesus stood up and Israel was cut off. And that is then dated in October. I think the 12th or the 10th, I can't remember, AD 33. And that is the starting point for the two days from when Israel was cut off. All right. If you measure 2,000 years, you get to October the 10th, 2033. That would be my date for the second coming, if I was to guess. All right. And that actually happens to be, you can check it out, it happens to be, on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, because I believe Jesus will fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles in his second coming, all right? And so that's October the 10th, 2033. And interestingly enough, if you if you try a, an astronomy program like Stellarium, you will find, you remember it says that before the great and awesome day of the Lord, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon will be turned to blood. Now, this happened in the first century because the great and awesome day in AD 33 was the day of the resurrection. And two days before the resurrection, the sun turned to darkness, didn't it? Uh, And also the moon turned to blood. There was a lunar eclipse. You can check that out. So there was two signs, the natural sign of the lunar eclipse, the moon to blood, the sun to darkness was the supernatural sign. And, And because Daniel's 70th week is rerun, You'll get the same two things happening, according to that pattern, two days before the second coming, the sun will be turned to darkness, there'll be a blackout, and the moon will be turned to blood, there will be a lunar eclipse. And that's confirmed in Revelation 6, where the moon is turned to blood, and the sun is turned to darkness, and uh, that's prophesied, as you know, in Matthew 24 as well. If you look at Stellarium... October the 8th, which is two days before October the 10th, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, is a total lunar eclipse. The moon will turn to blood, and it's a total eclipse of the moon right there. So there's a little confirmation 
that that God may be working according to that timetable. But God may have completely other ideas in mind. But um, that's uh, the fulfillment of Hosea's prophecy would be October 2033 Feast of Tabernacles. That would mean the rapture, if it's a pre-trib rapture, would be seven years before that, which would place it around 2026. All right. But remember, no one knows. This is just our uh, our uh, speculation, if you like, based on types and shadows. There is no plain statement of scripture that says when the Lord's coming. So we honestly do not know. But that's the best guess. All right. Well, I hope that doesn't get me in trouble because. All right. If it doesn't happen, please don't blame me. I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying this is an interesting. How can what I would say is this is an interesting solution to the biblical data. This 2026 to 2033, it fits all the typology rather nicely. But God may have completely different way of of resolving the whole issue. So we honestly, God wants us to live as if He could come any time. All right. Well, we've we've had a good time. God bless you. Amen. Thank you.